Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode, don't know, I'll be honest, I don't know. The key thing is what we're going to talk about today. Now earlier on, early on, sorry, in my fitness career, I was very much influenced by Paul Check initially. Great guy, great practitioner, he's been on the show, I'm sure you love that show if you've listened to it. And then in that work was very much tied up this idea of ancestral health and where health actually comes from and how our modern day of living is maybe derailing the possibility and the potential of our health as individuals. And along that side of uh, the work was um, my discovery of Weston A. Price's work, who wrote a book, I might butcher the title here, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, something like that. Um, My guest will probably correct me in a minute if I've got it wrong. But the idea was that this dude was a dentist, He started to notice patterns in people that were changing their diet and he started to say like, whoa, hang on a second, Like, we we really need to think about what we're doing nutritionally here and that is what we're going to talk about today with my guest uh, who is a doctor of the dentist world, uh, author of The Dental Diet, uh, Dr. Stephen Lin. Hello. Ben, pleasure, mate. Now, now you absolutely nailed that title, so I can't correct you in any way. You, you, you summed it up so well. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I did. I tried because I probably read that book like 10 years ago, but it, it is welded in my brain. And I think what excites me about the information that we're going to talk about today is in my world, in sports, in nutrition, in the body, in you know the, the mainstream of health and fitness in the UK, is we're so focused on like calories and macros and body composition, all this kind of stuff, which is amazing, don't get me wrong. It's very empowering information. There's so much about the components of what we eat that sometimes we're missing. And this is what I love about uh, your work. And uh, this is also spurred and kind of is quite emotive for me at the moment. Um, Chris Cresser has just also brought out a new book. I'm a big fan of Chris Cresser's work. Uh, He's brought out a new book called Unconventional Medicine. And again, he was actually starting to say, guys, we're, we're doing some good stuff in nutrition, but we're still not really impacting disease. Like, mm. we've got to look at this stuff. Like, why are we still getting diabetes? Why are we still getting obese? When the awareness of information is so, so high. So anyway, enough of talking of other people. <laughs> Let's talk about you. Um, Stephen, don't, talk to me about, like, the journey to date. What got you interested in where your head's at? Yeah, but it, look, it's really interesting actually because you know it's quite similar, and I've actually, everyone that I've talked to in this field has uh, kind of a similar you know aha moment, and it actually uh, happened you know, a similar time frame around ten years ago um, when I began to, to practice in dentistry and I began to see patients, and you know I realized um, you know dentistry is a very rewarding job in that you, you can fix someone's smile, you know that's quite an amazing thing you can do for someone. Um, and so you, you kind of practice your trade in this and you, you get better at doing these things. Now, after a while, I began to kind of get a little bit, you know, a little bit, I started to question things a little bit because people would still come into my practice and I could fix things, but they would ask questions that I couldn't answer. You know, like why would some kids need braces and, uh, and other kids not? Why do my wisdom teeth get impacted? Why, do, why is my gum disease uh, responding to this treatment? So those questions kept coming up and I didn't have answers. And so I went looking through my, um, you know, my professional, uh, you know, textbooks and, and all my background education, and there really wasn't a, a good explanation for what my patients were asking about and what I was seeing in the practice. And so this began to kind of play in my mind, and I actually took some time off work, and it, uh, so I actually went through Europe, uh, visited uh, the UK, but also it was in um, in Turkey and uh, in a backpackers hostel there where there was a shared book um, uh, depository where people kind of leave a book and go on their way and one book read Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, the, the, the book by Weston A. Price that you mentioned. I had never heard of this book in seven years of, of, uh, of, of university training so I was kind of like, what's this? And I picked it up, flicked it through it and I was like, it spoke to me on a very deep level but I didn't understand it. And so at that point, I kind of looked at it and I was like, well, this is interesting, you know, put it in the bag and I kind of forgot about it and I actually went back to it years later and it wasn't until I, it, the, the penny dropped when I started to, you know, see what Price was actually saying is that our food has changed our craniofacial system and this was a huge eye-opener for me what it basically said that is that crooked teeth and the reason why 
kids and all of uh, the last few generations that need braces is caused by our nutrition. And so that's not something that the dental industry uh, has broached whatsoever. And it was a very interesting concept for me. So I began to dive into anthropological uh, research. You know, that I was always into evolutionary biology. So I was really um, happy to kind of go down that road of research. But what I found was that dental disease and the, the teeth we are seeing and kids that don't develop 32 teeth in a jaw, this, hasn't, this has happened in a literal blink of an eye. And Price says this in his book. And, and so and ancestry, anthropologically, we have not – um, had these dental diseases, so jaws that don't fit teeth, that's, that's crooked teeth that need braces, wisdom teeth impactions, tooth decay and the whole lot, they don't exist in any, um, in any significant form throughout human history. And that's in every biological system as well. Animals don't have dental disease either. They don't have the wisdom teeth pulled. They don't have braces. It's, it just doesn't happen. So all of a sudden I started to realize is that what I saw in the dental practice was significantly um, out of whack with what happens in nature. And then so Price's work then began to become a bit of a puzzle because he talked about things like vitamins A and D and this activator X. So he talked about these three factors mm -hmm. that grew the jaw. He says, right, people who eat these, these foods and they eat these three factors, they don't get the dental disease significantly and their jaws grow amazingly. Um, it happens in 14 cultures around the world. Right, you know, he looked at right when the um, traditional diets intercepted the modern diets, so this time in the 1930s, really unique period before the industrial industrialized diet swallowed the world. And so Price took photographs, he took dental exams, he looked ancestrally through the um, skull records and showed that, you know, this stuff doesn't happen until we eat the modern diet in one generation. And so the breakdown for him was that in these three um, vitamins work together. But Price published in 1938, and he actually died uh, about 10 years later, and he never identified Activator X. And so what that what that led is there was a, his work was lost. So the book was actually you know more or less disappeared for 60 years until the Western Price Foundation brought it back, and that's probably why I didn't hear about it at dental school. And and you know this, this is really what I've been trying to work to to bring some um, awareness back at Price. But the issue was then, we re reprinted the book in 99, and we were still calling Activated X, Activated X. So we didn't know what this nutrient was that he was talking about. And so that it took another 10 years, nearly in 2007, for Chris Masterjohn to identify that Activated X was vitamin K2. And vitamin K2 has been one of the most confused nutrients in the, um, you know, it would probably go down in history as the most misunderstood nutrient um, you know, in, in healthcare or in science, basically, and it's very different from vitamin K. But what he showed was that, that we now know that vitamin K2 works with vitamin A and D. They fuel an immune system inside your tooth, so it makes you immune to tooth decay. They fuel jaw growth. It fuels nearly every system throughout the body. These three vitamins do, you know, the, the research on vitamin D now is so deep. It goes right down to your genes, to your telomeres, to aging. All of this has come out only in the last 10 years. So I found out that there was all this research that's actually collaborating what Price was saying, and he was just ahead of his time. He was, he, you know, his perception on what he saw in uh, in what people ate and how it affected their um, their their craniofacial structures was just outstanding. But there is now a scientific story to plug it in, and so that's what the dental diet is about. Is about my journey putting that in and understanding how nutrition affects my patients and every condition we see in the mouth, including wisdom teeth impactions, uh, crooked teeth, is all caused by the diet. And this is, we're basically in a orthodontia epidemic at the moment. So our kids don't grow uh, 32 teeth and this is one of the biggest health problems on the planet and we've somehow missed it. It's insane that we've forgotten this information and Price's misunderstanding has been really part of why we haven't done that. So. That's where, that's where I've kind of come to the point where I was building a program for my patients uh, to, to kind of heal and reverse this disease and, and put them on a, um, a track to healing in life. But the, the story behind it and the, uh, and the, the science that's plugged in uh, you know, be, you know, between that time is absolutely unbelievable. And so that's what I, when I realized I had to write a book on this and it took me a long time. Um, but it, it's something that I think that most people need to know that we are, uh, you know, we have drastically destroyed or changed our dental uh, structure. This is definitely something that's close to my heart because I think 
as a kid, I had about eight teeth removed. I had loads of different, uh, like, removable brace things. Then I had train tracks on the bottom. And I had loads of issues with my teeth. Like, they're, they're far from perfect. They're an absolute mess. Um, but I compare myself to my brother, who's got great teeth. My mum, she's got great teeth. But I haven't. And then musculoskeletally, I'm probably slightly worse off than my brother in terms of how my skeletal system has kind of um, grown. So it's absolutely fascinating. I don't I don't think this stuff can be ignored in any way, but it, it kind of almost sounds like, OK, we get to 2530. We realize this. What mileage do we actually have to change things? Because surely our dental structure by the time you get to adulthood is surely it's done, right? Well, actually, that's what we were taught in, in dental school. But the, the reality is, is that epigenetically, we can change our dental structure um, in any time in life. And so what we're taught in dental school was, for instance, the maxilla, which is the upper jaw. So what they say is the midline. So there's two parts of the maxilla comes together. The midline of your palate, they say, it fuses uh, when, when you get to late teens. And so that means it's done. But actually, they've, they've now found that there are actually stem cells in, in, that, uh, in that suture and that when you send it the right messages, when you pressure it, the, the stem cells will actually activate and you'll create bone. So you can expand the palate in a, into adulthood. And so there are now adulthood palatal expansion um, processes that you can go through that will actually change the entire craniofacial structure. And so I've seen, I've, I was working with a dentist in New York who uses brain surgery software to scan and see how the airways and the, and the, um, the skull changes when we just expand the palate. Because the palate is kind of the centerpiece of the um, of, of our skull, and so when we when we change it, it actually sets off this whole chain reaction to change the entire face. So what happens is you expand the palate just by nightly expansion. You kind of um, you flick a um, a little uh, uh, switch on a on, on, a, on an orthodontic um, device, and it, and it slowly places pressure on your palate. But then over six months, if you if you take a front on photograph and, and you do the scans, what happens is that so one side of the maxilla puts on bone. So you place bone where all this pressure is happening. But without putting direct pressure on, your, your mandible also reshapes as well. So you start to get symmetry in the jaw bones. And then the maxilla is the, the, the base of the eyes, so the orbits, so that the eyes level out. So people with, with a, a craniofacial structure that has kind of mis um, adjusted because of you know it's doing its best it can, you can re you can reestablish their their um their eye levels, but the most the most crucial thing, and this is the most I think one of the things we're going to find as being the most impactful uh you know kind of health innovations moving to the future is that the sphenoid bone, which sits at the base of the um of the skull, the the brain case, remodels as well. So you remodel the 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 bone that's holding your brain just by by expanding out your 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 palate, and so. There's deep, deep neurological and deep um, physiological impacts for this. So you're expanding the airway. One thing that I was never taught in dental school is that your upper teeth sit in the maxilla, which actually house your nasal sinuses as well. So when you expand the, the palate, you're increasing your airway. So, you, so you, people breathe better. And so anyone with a high palate and kind of crooked teeth, they, they've actually got a constricted um, nasal sinus. So you, you, you have less volume to, to breathe. And, and we're designed to breathe through our nose. There's, that we should d definitely cover that because people don't know that you, if you don't breathe properly through your nose, then you're missing out on you know, a vital, vital um, many chemical processes that help you absorb oxygen. Again, I, as a kid, had asthma and had trouble with my uh, breathing. <laughs> like, like, again, it's just, it's just absolutely fascinating. And you know, thinking about it and we talk about jaw structure, we know that hormonally people can do things hormonally that will change the jawline. Um, so we, we know this is we know this stuff can happen. But, you know, coming back to Western A Price's work, what, what do you think what do you think you've evolved from his work? What what has evolved in this space? Directly from Price. So so what you just mentioned there, so he he was speaking about the fat soluble vitamins, right? So, so vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K2. Now, conventional healthcare has basically scrubbed them off the, you know, vitamin D has only really been understood since about 2000. But when you go to, um, in medical school and dental school, you don't talk about them. And which is, if you think about dentists, dentists in particular, we should understand vitamin D 
you know, it's, it's our vitamin because you know bones and teeth are intricately driven by these by these processes. And so the the fat soluble vitamin system that that is a, a piece of physiology that that health professionals have missed out on, and it's the most important. This is what Price was saying. He was saying that these three vitamins create uh, cranial facial skulls that grow. They're completely resistant to other diseases. They're strong. They're they're healthy throughout life. Yet and and the reason is is because these vitamins do everything in the body. So what I found is that when when I when you go through the scientific literature and you understand what these uh, nutrients do, eating uh, and and this is what Price said is that traditional cultures always uh, you know kind of treasured these foods and made sure that they ate foods rich in fat soluble vitamins. So that's something that humans seem to have done right throughout our history. And so that remodeling our idea of uh, of eating so that we eat nutrients uh, rich in fat soluble vitamins um, which are foods that which are difficult to get by the way that we, if you don't think about it you don't get them and if you're in a place like the UK or south of Australia or um, you know where you don't get a lot of sun you're deficient in vitamin D I guarantee it, all of my patients are deficient in vitamin D and you know we really uh, even uh, some of the, the the levels we're told that we should get to are probably insufficient anyway so all of this has been completely missed out by the um, by health professionals and 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 dental professionals especially. But we can model exactly what all these nutrients do, and it's so simple. Once you kind of model for the mouth, you know how to eat for the rest of the body. We know, you know, the vitamin D, like we said, goes through, you know, has the impact on the gut, the, the immune system, metabolism, um, you know, right down to the genes of brains. You know, it prevents you from getting Alzheimer's disease because there's vitamin D receptors, thousands of them on the brainstem. And yet we're walking around vitamin D deficient. And this is exactly what Price was warning us about. He's saying you have to eat these three vitamins or you get sick and you don't your skeletal system doesn't develop. And it's mm-hmm. that obvious. So it's this insane gap that or you know, kind of block that we've put on these foods. And I think it does have a little bit to do with the low fat movement because we were yep. pushed away from because to absorb fat soluble vitamins, you need to eat fat. And so without fat, you don't that, that's what blood cholesterols are. Blood cholesterols or your lipoproteins are what carry your fat soluble vitamins around. So it's like a postage system. Mm -hmm. And so we now understand we've just removed the stigma around blood cholesterols. And so we we now understand that, hang on, this thing is a system that we need to feed that carries these crucial nutrients around. And that was not ever taught in medical school either. We're taught that blood cholesterols cause heart attacks. And so there's been a lot of misconception, but... I think what dental nutrition gives us, it gives us a model to kind of debunk all the stuff that we made mistakes on. We know that teeth aren't developing properly and how it affects the rest of the body. And now we can start to put simple processes back into place to kind of fix all the damage we've done. Mm. So there must be a massive or potentially big hormonal connection here because I talked about what people can do to change their jaw a lot of these vitamins, uh, sorry, these vitamins are involved in the hormonal system. Are we looking, and if, and I don't know if you have, have you tracked changing diets and if it sort of changes or evolves the hormonal system? Well, you're, you're exactly right in terms of, you know, we know that, um, that, that uh, certain hormones relate to jaw growth. And that, that is some, that's a crazy, crazy intervention that the orthodontic and dental industry hasn't thought about to the jaw growth we know testosterone for instance uh you know has an effect on, on growing the jaw yet we haven't thought about why kids that aren't growing um you know whether they have enough testosterone or not but the the factors are threefold so i mean vitamin d for instance is in a threefold trilogy with growth hormone so growth hormone and the insulin like growth factor um, pathway it, it, it sits in a trilogy with vitamin D. So vitamin D goes both ways. So both growth hormone conversion to um, insulin-like growth factor and vice versa working in the liver. You know it doesn't work without vitamin D. So if your vitamin D is deficient, your body isn't isn't um, stimulating or isn't using and releasing growth hormone effectively. So any anyone that wants to increase their growth hormone um, output and use and, and efficiency in the body, you should be absolutely monitoring your vitamin D levels uh, religiously. But then on the other side of it is testosterone. And so testosterone, we know, uh, for instance, kids that are deficient in testosterone will have stunted jaws. They'll have um, uh, asymmetrical uh, uh, craniofacial growth. Uh, but And so vitamin K2, and so this is uh, only in rat studies so far, but we, vitamin K2 directly stimulates testosterone release from the testes. And, you know, 
you think about the crazy things we're doing to try and increase our testosterone levels. If you just eat AD and K2, take a you know, um, making sure you're getting three dietary sources of vitamin K2, um, and this is the MK. There's, we should cover this as well. There's two versions of MK of yeah. vitamin K2. Um, this is the MK4 version that's likely more active in this because there's a whole pathway. But that's directly releasing testosterone, and we know now that there's 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 a growing number of guys out there that have low testosterone, and I can guarantee you it's from not eating uh, diets that that uh, feed these fat soluble vitamins. So it's the easiest way that anyone thinking about performance or growth or um or kind of uh, you know any kind of uh, exercise performance they you should, this is your baseline. And that's a be- beautiful thing about dental is that you get your baseline right, and then you can you, you can change all the other parameters from there. But this is this is stuff that's so deep in your human your um, physiology that you cannot ignore. So looking at the diet and what we potentially might change, and how you see these changes impacting our health, where does your dietary methodology? What does it look like now? What what are you trying to promote to people? Is it just eat natural? Is it we kind of really need to avoid that food and we must eat these groups of food. How does it look? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, basically I, I do have, in the dental diet, I do have a food pyramid. Um, so that, it, you know, it kind of just, and that's not to be strict on, but it just gives you an idea of what, you know, the, the kind of, it's basically a rethink on food. And so once you have the principles, you, you'll you always look at food and think, right, am I doing this, am I doing this? And so the main thing is to, um, you know, we need to remove the harmful factors, which is uh, refined sugar, refined flour, vegetable oils. Those three things are important. Vegetable oils are important because they ruin the the um, the blood cholesterol and lipid protein system that carry these fat soluble vitamins around your body. So we they sneak into. I was just in the UK actually a few months ago, and I was looking at all the packaging, and, and you guys have a lot of sunflower oil um, there. So all of that is the hydrogenated, and they're very um, unstable in the body so this is what's um potentially uh stopping your your lipoprotein system from working properly so removing them but then we need to start feeding your body is hungry for fat soluble vitamins so every meal you should be eating a food that is a source of a fat soluble nutrient so things like butter um grass raised uh eggs uh, uh, from chickens raised on pasture um organ meats you eating a slice of liver or two a week is what it's one of the most nutrient dense foods in the, in the um that, that you can eat and so uh having reintroducing organ meats to your um to your regime is is one of the best ways you can get get these nutrients because they're not easy to get um so grass raised uh dairy uh things like cheeses fermented foods they're very specific specific foods and for instance uh for dairy it, uh for those that have of oh, dairy is a very controversial topic but if you if you have um dairy from grain fed cows you don't there's no vitamin d there's no vitamin k2 or vitamin a because they don't um synthesize it from the uh, with a lack of sun sunlight and grass so all of these vitamins require careful sourcing that you know where they're coming from and they've been treated in a certain way so understanding that and the epigenetics of food is really important and then the last point is really to balance the microbiome. So the oral microbiome is where you've got you know, hundreds of species in the mouth. And we've always kind of thought that we brush teeth and you know, scrub and disinfect the mouth. But you, that's actually your protective uh, mechanisms for dental disease. So they protect probiotic species in the mouth, protect you against tooth decay, against gum disease, against all these other – and you're swallowing thousands of these uh, species every second. So balancing out your microbiome and really I, I think my message with this is that when you're eating, you're actually eating for trillions of other bugs as well. Make sure you have to eat the fibers, to, and they're releasing factors that are directly um, going across your your gut lining to your immune system and messaging right throughout the body. So if you're not eating enough fiber and you're not eating a diverse amount of fiber, then you're directly destroying this, and it begins in the mouth. And so, removing factors that are, for instance, antibacterials and and things that are killing your diversity in the mouth. Um, and, and that also goes for the gut as well. So those three factors are kind of you know really simplified. But in the book, there's also a, a food pyramid. We go through each each um, kind of food group. Uh, but it's really about feeding yourself the right thing. So instead of like restricting, instead of measuring, there's no measuring. Um, we make sure we're eating foods that are naturally sourced. Uh, you know, we're getting those whole fats. 
getting back to, to making sure that we're eating all the, the fats that our bodies are designed to, and that's what helps us design those, uh, absorb those nutrients. So they're the basic principles that we kind of go through in the book, and uh, it's really a, a template uh, you know, that, so that you can see food to make sure that we that you that you understand that what what you're eating is potentially something that your body recognizes or it doesn't. Mm. See, all of this is fascinating uh, to me, especially as we start to look at you know the sugar side of nutrition. Because in 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 the UK, and don't get me wrong, I've helped spearhead this movement with how I can. Is that we now have a greater understanding of caloric control and the components that our body actually needs on a macronutrient level. And we're, we, for me, we're still not appreciating and understanding that there's a, a massive micronutrient component here. The micronutrients are the things that are signaling and building and doing all the cool stuff that our physiology needs to operate. And if we take a diet and someone needs two and a half thousand calories a day, great. I and you would then raise the question, what are those two and a half thousand calories? Because health isn't just about weight. There's a component issue here. And I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick's work. And she talks a lot about sugar. And she says, you know, this is great. We're all calorie controlling our food and we're doing cool stuff. But if we've got a diet that's 20, 30 percent refined, like what are we doing for our health? What are we doing for the signaling of disease and how and and I would agree with the fact that sugar is still a raw building block. It is a fuel source. So we can't argue with some of the physiology of how it operates on an energy perspective. Um so a lot of people I think will be sitting now listening to this interview thinking okay, I, I've got that stuff. Where does sugar play a role in like actual sort of direct tooth decay? and maybe some other direct physiological signaling. I'm assuming you talk about that a fair bit in the book. Absolutely. So there's two so I mean, sugar is of, sugar's a really interesting one because, you know, we're kind of waking up to the fact that, you know, it's not as simple as, and there are uh, health consequences of eating too much sugar. You know, the whole uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, we're getting fatty liver now. Um, you know, the, the obesity epidemic, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of literature out there saying that uh, eating too much sugar uh, has been the large driver of that. So the sugar versus fat kind of argument is something that we discuss. And what you bring up, I think, is very, um, very poignant because, uh, you know, one, I don't like to talk about calories, but let's do it for the sake of the argument, is that say you take a calorie of fat, say you take a calorie of sugar, it's going to do very different things in your body. And so the, the, signal, the hormonal signaling of what sugar and, and uh, simple carbohydrates do in your body is really what potentially is, is causing um, these health issues. So for instance, fructose. Fructose has to be broken down in the liver. Um, so there's two types of sugar. So, so when fructose uh, enters your, your gut, it's, it's cleaved. So your body can, can break down glucose, but the fructose has to go to your liver. And that drives an inflammation process that stores belly fat. So the amount of fructose you're eating, and Roughly, most table sugar is about half. Um, so in Australia, we have cane sugar. In America, they have sources that are a bit higher in fructose. But the amount of, of um, uh, calories, for instance, you're eating in fructose is directly going to your liver. So there is a, a hormonal and a, um, and, a, and kind of a, a metabolic pathway factor that we need to be considering. Um, and then so for, uh, for the microbiome, for instance, now if we use tooth decay as an example, we've thought that um, tooth decay is a kind of infection you know that we that that we eat sugar and these bad bacteria spring up and and then eat our teeth. But tooth decay is actually a long term dysbiosis of our microbiome. So and what actually I like to prepare, uh, compare it to is an ecological system. So when you have an ecological system and a, a kind of a good analogy is the Yellowstone National Park. So in the early 1920s or 30s they removed all the wolves. And so what, what they actually found is the park was completely destroyed. The, eco the ecology of the park, the park right down to where the rivers ran dry, be, uh, happened because there, uh, there was overgrowth, overgrowth of, of certain species. And when they reintroduced the wolves in the 80s and 90s, the, the whole ecosystem of the park came back. And so we've actually been doing the same thing to our mouth. We've been seeing this one species that's causing tooth decay. We're saying, you know, that's the species – you know, we can knock it out and brush it and mouth and you know throw mouthwash into our mouth. But actually, uh, when we lose diversity over a long period of time, that's when we get disease. And so tooth decay is actually a starvation 
uh, mode of your microbiome where you've lost diversity, just like in the Yellowstone National Park, and that allows the, the pathogenic species to overgrow. So if you're constantly feeding sugar into your mouth and the same thing's happening in your gut, you're swallowing the same thing, you're killing diversity because it feeds these fast metabolizing bugs. You're not feeding those slower metabolizing um, uh, probiotic species that actually protect you against these and, and do other physiological processes, and you're, you're starving out your mi microbiome. So that's what tooth decay kind of tells us about sugar. But the, the long term and the kind of, um, you know, I think the broader message is that we really need to be eating for diversity, and, and sugar hasn't been eaten uh, in its, in its um, kind of loose form, so without its fiber context. So in, in, um, in nature, you, you access simple sugars by eating a vegetable or a fruit, you break down the fiber, which is the complex carbohydrates around the outside, and then the, the simple sugars are released. So in a microbiome context, the, the slow metabolizing bugs are doing the, the digestive um, work first, then you're releasing the simple sugars, and then, the, and then so the whole system is working in balance. When you throw simple sugars straight into your microbiome, you're, you're sending like a, a tsunami in, and what it does is it can, puts off the, the whole system. So th there's, a ver there's a very different physiological kind of um, and detailed uh, model of what we can see food is doing. It's easily seen in the mouth. That's what, that's what we go through in the dental diet. We understand everything from the mouth and see how it's connected directly to the gut, directly to your immune system, directly to the, um, your metabolism, directly to the brain. And it's just that simple when we understand it from this ancestral but also um, you know, a dental perspective. So I suppose to round off this conversation, which has been fascinating, when we look at dental care, should we be doing different things? Like you talked about the diet almost influencing the, the quality and the health of our teeth. So that makes me think, well, should I clean my teeth at all? But no, actually, I want fresh breath. And the reason why I ask is I actually personally only clean my teeth once a day. And a lot of people will say you should do it twice a day. But my intuitive brain doesn't want me to clean it twice a day because I find and I, you know, I have normal, you know, technique and shit and I've worked on, you know, swilling around and all that kind of stuff. But I find <laughs> it aggravates my mouth. I find it like too much of an aggressive approach. So I just have, you know, a gentle, clean, like mid morning and then and then that's it. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but there's part of my brain that will not like over focus on just cleansing my mouth. See, but this is why you're such a smart guy because you intuitively know what's good for you, right? And you're <laughs> completely right because, because I mean, like the the only way that you know the the primary um, source of, of of advice the dental uh, industry has been giving out is right. You need to brush and floss, and that's like if you think about you know your, your car. If your car has an engine problem, you don't take it to the car wash, do you? And that's what brushing and flossing is. It's 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 a, a very superficial um, scrubbing of, of of the plaque or the biofilm in your mouth. That biofilm is performing a physiological function. So those those bugs in your mouth are forming plaque for a reason. They, they need it to survive. Sure, yes, you you can brush it and you can stop uh, patho uh, pathogenic buildup by doing that. But the real way to to prevent disease and and you know uh, encourage uh, lifelong health is by one, feeding your body and your, your skeletal system the nutrients that actually protect yourself against these uh, any kind of disease. So like I mentioned itself, there is an immune, there are immune cells inside your teeth. So they are called odontoblasts. They are fed by vitamin A, vitamin D. They release factors that are then uh, uh, activated by vitamin K2. So this trilogy of nutrients are basically, if, I see patients that don't brush well all the time. Nearly no kids brush well. No kids do. Yet we're, we're kind of pretending that it's all about oral hygiene. It's not. It's about feeding yourself the right things. It's about balancing that microbiome as well. So on the inside, you've got the tooth with the immune system. On the outside, you've got the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of bugs crawling around the, your mouth. You balance that out and you make sure they're getting their fiber and they're spitting out the defensive systems here. The tooth sits there, you know, absolutely um, untouched, and, and you know it's a harsh environment. You've got saliva with digestive enzymes. You've got um, you know it's crunching and chewing, and um, and you know kind of you know lots of different uh, bacteria being introduced. But if you balance that and you just eat what your body has been designed to eat for thousands of years, 
it makes complete sense. So we really need to rejig this. And so the, the, your intuition there was completely right, was that there was more to it. Sure, people can brush your teeth. Why not? You know, like that's part of a, you know, living in society. We don't want to walk around with bad breath, but let's not pretend that it's the be all and end all for dental and, and whole body health. So out of interest, what, what do you do with your teeth? Like how do you take care of them? I, I, I brush. I don't use toothpaste anymore, just because. Why would I use toothpaste when I eat foods uh, to protect my te- uh, the, to keep my vitamin D levels, my vitamin A, vitamin K two. When I when I eat lots of fiber and uh, probiotic foods and, and prebiotic fibers, why do I need toothpaste? I don't need it. And so, uh, for instance, fluoride is an antibacterial. So when you when you're putting fluoride into your mouth all the time, it's killing bugs that we don't even know there. We've only identified half of the species in the mouth. So. Any antibacterial that's on a shelf and they say it kills 99% of bugs, no, it doesn't. They don't. We don't know what uh, 50% of the bugs are in the mouth, and that is, that's it's just bacteria. There's even you know things like uh, fungi and uh, even weirder things like archaea and all these strange things that we've got no idea what they do. And so any antibacterial is doing things that, you, that uh, the scientists and you don't understand. So I've, I've removed that. Um, the, the main ticket forward is is with food, removing those harmful factors, you know, things like um, the, yeah, the real thing for, for, uh, for dental disease is the, the simple carbohydrates. So juices are a big problem, you know, kind of stick. Uh, a lot of the health bars actually always check, for, for instance, the kind of um, the supplements and health bars and, and the cereals and whatnot uh, that, that market themselves as uh, kind of exercise because there's usually a lot of sugar in them. Um, and so uh, look, I just tell my patients to count. You know, sure, you can have them every now and again, and obviously, like you said, there's a, um, especially for people that exercise a lot, you know, you can afford to have a bit more sugar, but for those that, you know, perhaps aren't or that, you know, are kind of trying to heal themselves, you know, count your sugar and understand how much is going into your body as well. Mm. Fascinating. So, is there an argument for, like, more natural toothpaste, fluoride flea toothpaste? Is there almost an argument to have like probiotics in our toothpaste to make sure that we there's almost like a, another opportunity to populate good bacteria. Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, probiotic bacteria. That's a new, you know, if if you could put in a good probiotic bacteria uh, toothpaste together, that's that'd be a, a, a big product. But so the, the new <laughs> right <laughs> a note. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Need to go now. <laughs> but th- there's a few brands out there that are prebiotic, um, uh, to, so they actually put the fiber. Now that 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 makes a lot of sense because um, you know you kind of introduce and the the prebiotic uh, fibers are sitting in the mouth for a bit while you're, you're scrubbing, um, and that actually makes a lot of sense because that's going to feed those um, those probiotic slow metabolizing species. They're going to release those short chain fatty acids. And so there are these these um, toothpastes are starting to come onto the, the market. They're a bit funny because I, I, this took a bit of adjusting for me as well because you kind of want that really fresh kind of mm. um, you know like you know, like minty feeling. And it's so there are a few you know um, it, it does taste a little bit different. You know people do oil pulling and stuff, you know, which is interesting. Um, but you know it, it it is a bit different to that kind of very chemically minty feel. So. And um, and I, I really don't advise artificial sweeteners in any um, way or form because we don't same thing with the microbiome. It just doesn't. Uh, we don't know what they do, and you know there's a lot of uh, evidence showing that it's actually harmful and can, can increase your risk of putting weight on them and and um, things like that. So uh, xylitol, I don't. Uh, all of those things, unless it's natural, you know, I I, I don't think we don't really know what it does. So I just always try and minimize and tell my patients to minimize as much as possible. So. I suppose the last thing that's maybe on my mind from a people listening point of view is you really probably dislike chewing gum as well. Well, some chewing gum, there's a few um, There's a few brands. It really depends. A lot of the chewing gum has either sugar in it or um, or artificial sweetness. So a lot of it's got uh, aspartame in it and that's such nasty. And I was actually, I, I, like, I like a minty kind of chewing gum just because I like the, you know, um, and you, cause I don't use toothpaste, so putting a, um, but it, you know, a, a, a gum in kind of helps, but finding one that doesn't have an artificial sweetener or doesn't have sugar is really hard. So there are a few natural brands out there. I'm not sure in the UK or, um, but that for instance, there are some that use kind of, um, uh, gum bark and stuff like that, or, or there are fibers and whatnot. Um, yeah, they generally cinnamon- taste quite pants. 
Yeah, exactly. I actually, I got one from Whole. I remember I was in Whole Foods. I think in in the UK, and I think I bought one. I was like, oh, this is awful. It's, it, I didn't. Yeah, like it, it tasted really bad. But there are a few. I, I think we're going to find now because all this stuff with the oral microbiome is quite new. So I think we're going to find there's a lot more um, uh, brands out there. So as long as you kind of know the you know the principles, you, you're going to be able to look out, and you can do some homemade stuff as well. You know, like peppermint oil or. Uh, um, you know things like a vanilla essence sometimes you know for mouthwash or whatever um, with a coconut oil that's or um, baking soda is quite soda is quite good as well so you can do a little bit, a bit of experimentation at home um, but ultimately yeah, I just wouldn't be doing those antibacterials that we don't know in the long term um, there's actually a study out recently that people that use um, long-term mouthwash were at higher risk of uh, pre-diabetes and so that was really interesting um, in terms of because obviously what's happening is loss of diversity of the oral microbiome mm. uh, going to the gut and we know the um you know the, the characteristic gut microbiome for type 2 diabetes so all of this is fascinating i think in the modern sort of the modern movement and technology and convenience we let's just raise the question of everyone listening of how much are we doing in our lifestyle that feels and is really natural from a diet perspective, from a movement perspective, from an exposure to our environmental stimuluses, the way that we think, you know, the more and more we get away from what we've maybe done for a very long time. And, you know, and all of this is a, is a stress thing. Diet can be a stress. The way that we think can be a stress. The way that we hydrate can be a stress. So, you know, really, and it's already happening, there is a massive movement towards identifying all these factors that are really overwhelming people's physiology. And everyone is more, you know, has a different level of sort of susceptibility. You know, I look at some people and think that, you know, their bodies can handle a lot of stress. And there's some people that can't. And I think that's what made me really interested in health, nutrition and performance is because I, I felt that I wasn't one of those people that, could just abuse their body and, 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 and not be, you know, and be okay. I had bad teeth, I had bad breathing, musculoskeletally not great, I was obese as a kid, like all of these things pointing towards the fact that I should and could be doing better by my health. Um, Stephen, uh, amazing. Thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Um, the Dental Diet, I assume it is available on all the places we buy books, like the Amazon thing. Yeah, available on Amazon uh, for pre-order at the moment, out on January 9th, so you can grab your copy then. Uh, you can also grab it off uh, the link on my website, drstephenlin.com. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I really love that message, Ben, because you know that really is powerful in that we have the you – know, we, we can identify where our, our fall-downs are and, and you know we have the, the power to, to shape our, our future health. So that, I really love that message. I think that's where you know we really need to go that we're, we're the – the you know, kind of our destiny is in, in our own hands. Mm. Well, the book's out, so go and get it. Um, and I, 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 I want to read it. I haven't read it. I got uh, Stephen's notes sent to me by his uh, amazing PR people, so I haven't actually read the Dental Diet, but I'm fascinated. I myself. thought we sent you a copy. We'll, we'll get that sent across. We'll, I'll get Sean to uh, send that straight across, mate. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Um, I just, you know, when I read um, Weston A. Price's book back in the day, I just found it, found it fascinating. And I just looked at people and I thought, there's, there's something in this. Just look at people. There is something in this. And I think that's what's fascinating. Um, lastly, Stephen, where can people find you on social media? I assume you're active in a few places. Yeah, so they can find me on Instagram at Dr. Stephen Lynn, D-R-S-T-E-V-E-N-L-I-N, or on Facebook at Dr. Stephen Lin, S-T-E-V-E-N-L-I-N. Um, yeah, and so, it, or on my website, drstephenlin.com. Awesome. Mate, thank you again for coming on the show. If you have enjoyed this show, share it around. Come on. This information is powerful. Tag someone in a Facebook post, send it to them on email, screenshot it and bang it on your Insta stories. Like to share the wealth of information. Um, also, if you've come over from uh, Dr. Stephen Lin's side, hopefully you've enjoyed the show. There's another four years worth of episodes here. Um, we've had a lot of amazing guests on the show talking about a lot of amazing things. Um, all that leaves me to say is I will see you next week, uh, next Thursday when we release the next show. Who will be on that show? I've no idea. But it will be another amazing guest. It will be myself and Tom. Um, final time, 
Dr. Stephen Lynn, thank you very much for your work. You're doing great things. Keep doing it. Keep exploring. Keep pushing the boundaries. That's what the health and fitness industry needs. People to keep asking questions of whether what we're doing is right or not. My pleasure. Thank you for all your work, mate. You're doing a great job too. I really appreciate having you on there and I'm really looking forward to further conversations too. Awesome. Right, everyone, go and enjoy the rest of your day and ultimately stay awesome. Goodbye. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 305.